Welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. The 16-bit revolution is continuing on with Nintendo Power number 29 for October of 1991. We're covering another Super Nintendo game this issue, along with another PC port. Well, we got a lot of ground to cover, and we're having to split this episode in half again, so let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is Star Trek for the NES, and we have another diorama cover. Looks like the artist used a model kit of the Enterprise refit from the first three Star Trek films with some internal lighting, which is actually a really cool touch. In the letters column, we have letters from kids whose parents are hogging the console, with one parent of note being a die-hard RPG player. You know what? If you're one of the kids whose letters got published this issue... Please let me know. I'd like to hear from you. Heck, if you are one of the parents featured in this issue, particularly the one who's the diehard RPG player, also let me know. I'd like to know if you're still playing video games and what you're playing. Heck, if you're interested in doing like a Skype interview or whatever, that would be pretty cool too. Anyway, we also have two stories of players with hand injuries who compensate by playing the NES with their feet. Like with the article earlier about us... Uh, Sip and puff controllers helping people with mobility issues, with hand dexterity issues due to injuries, being able to still play video games. I wonder if this is a thing that's still viable with modern controllers, particularly stuff that uses, um, heavily uses uh, triggers and bumpers. Kind of curious. We then move on to our second featured NES game overall, and our first game of the issue with F Zero. We have a rundown of the controls and, four, and the four selectable vehicles. We also have maps of each of the three leagues, Knight, Queen, and King. It bears mentioning that this is the first game write-up I've encountered in Nintendo Power that actually discusses the controls in the write-up. Normally, if I need to know anything about the controls, I have to look up a scan of the manual online or check an FAQ that has the control information listed. F-Zero is an excellently put-together racing game, and probably one of the best console racing games of all time. Yes, I'm including modern 16-bit, not 16-bit, modern 32-bit or later generation stuff, like current gen. I'm including games like Wipeout in this. This game's controls are incredibly smooth, they work perfectly, the track designs are put together incredibly well, and the game has its own excellent sense of speed, considering the hardware and the tech. Each of the track types has its own distinct look and its own distinct shtick, where you know coming into it, okay, this is probably going to be a windy track, or this is going to be a very twisty, turny track, or this one's going to have some environmental obstacles. As soon as you encounter a track of this type, you can have a reasonable guess of what's going to come up with later tracks of that type. Additionally, I suspect, though I have no actual proof on this, that this game kind of spearheaded and built the popularity that allowed later games like Wipeout and other futuristic racing games, Extreme G, that sort of thing, to come into existence. They, this game kind of showed that hey, there's a popular, there's a desire for racing games that go above and beyond your tire, your, your vehicle tires on a track. People, when people want to go fast, they want to go really fast. As it is, um. I also like the fact that each of the four racers handle differently enough that players shouldn't have any problems finding one that fits their play style, while all of them are very well balanced with each other, to the point that with knowledge of the track in your vehicle, you shouldn't have any problems winning with any of the four. All of them just work control-wise. Uh, no racer is inherently superior to the other ones. Well, it's the October issue, so in Nestor's Adventures, Nestor is going trick-or-treating. I'll give them credit. This is the first time they've done a strip of Nestor's Adventures or Howard and Nestor that is actually meant to link up with a particular holiday in that issue's month. Anyway, our tip for this issue is for Star Wars. And it is that if you get a running start, you can jump across further gaps. I'm pretty sure it's been a thing in video games, in particular NES games, since Super Mario Brothers, so I'm not sure how this tip in particular is unique to Star Wars. <sighs> Remember when Howard and Nestor strips gave tips that were specific to certain games? Specific to those games? Like getting through a particular gap in Ninja Gaiden by doing a triangle jump downwards, or finding a hidden pizza in, T in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? I miss those days. 
In classified information, we have the stage select code for Vice Project Doom, which I think is a rerun. On a newer front, we have a bunch of user-submitted tips for Super Mario World. Like, a two pages worth of them. Next up is our cover game, and one in a franchise near and dear to my heart. The NES port of, Star of Interplay's Star Trek... Ah. Next up is our cover game, one in a franchise near and dear to my heart. The NES port of Interplay's Star Trek 25th Anniversary Adventure Game. Sadly, this game doesn't have the voice acting that the game's CD-ROM release had. Also, the article gets Lieutenant Uhura's name wrong, instead giving her name as Lieutenant Uhuru. I realize the internet wasn't widely available at the time, and there wasn't anything like Wikipedia. Still, you'd think someone in the office would watch Star Trek and would be able to give a correction on Lieutenant Uhura's name. Either that, or whoever wrote the, her name down doesn't close their A's. And who does that? Anywho... The guide itself gives some tips on the early episodes of the game. Now, I want to apologize in advance for any video glitches that you may see. This is due to the emulator I'm using to capture gameplay footage. I'm also using a Retron 5 for my home console playing, so because that is effectively a software emulator as well, those glitches may also appear on that system. Um, I can safely say that they had no noticeable effect on the gameplay, only on the graphics. Star Trek is a interesting adventure game. Unlike most of the genre, there are some significant action elements to the game. You're going around planets, occasionally there are critters on the planet that will try to kill you, you have to stun them, that sort of thing. However, there isn't really a death penalty. It's not like, oh, King's Quest or Maniac Mansion, where you can die, it's game over, you have to go back to your last save. If your away team is disabled on the planet's surface, it is beamed up to the Enterprise, at which point you just beam right back down again. Structurally, the game tries to replicate a episode of Star Trek for each little planet you go to. On each planet, there is a problem the Enterprise must resolve before moving on to the next world, starting with the need to find dilithium crystals to having to go undercover on Sigma Eosia, the planet from a piece of the action, to retrieve Dr. McCoy's lost... Um, it's either tricorder or communicator. It's a communicator. Um, the game's music even replicates some of Alexander Courage's themes from the show. My main complaint with the game is that you have very little control of the movement of the other members of your away team. If the action elements of the games were removed, this wouldn't really be a problem. Um, as it stands, it can cause some unnecessary setbacks in away missions where a crewman just kind of keeps stumbling in front of the killer plant on whatever world you're on and get up getting themselves taken out. Ca thus causing you, if it's a mission and critical character, to have to beam up to the Enterprise to recover the injured crewman and then beam back down again. All in all, if you are a Star Trek fan, this is definitely a game that's worth picking up, or at least that's what I'd like to say. Um, I say, I say that because as of this recording, the CD-ROM version with voice acting by all of the original cast of the show, including DeForest Kelly, is available for purchase on GOG for $6 US, and it will run on pretty much every system. So get that version instead. You will thank me later. Next, LJN has another baseball game with Roger Clemens' MVP Baseball. The article doesn't um, appear to show that the game has either the MLB team or Players Association license, but it does have the endorsement of Roger Clemens, so that's something, I guess? Anyway, this is a baseball game with a very, very different camera perspective than probably any other baseball game I've ever played on any console, including modern ones. Specifically, during fielding, the camera angle is placed lower to the ground and closer to the fielder, to... I suspect, somewhat replicate the view that that player would have while fielding, and thus theoretically allow the player to better ju judge where the ball was going to end up, and in turn, again, in theory, allowing them to field about as well as the computer does. 
it's a really novel concept and I like it. The problem is, is because I'm so utterly used to how every other baseball game handles controls, particularly with fielding, in order to do well at this game, I have to unlearn everything I've learned about playing baseball video games. Still, it's an attempt to balance fielding so the player and the computer are on equal footing, and I have to applaud the developers for that. In fact, this is probably the most ambitious and creatively designed sports game I have ever encountered in terms of how it tries to shake things up, and I am pleased by the fact that this game was coming out of LJN of all publishers. Let it no longer be said that everything that came out of LJN was crap. In Counselor's Corner, we have a bunch of adventure game and RPG tips, in particular with, adva with advice for Maniac Mansion, The Uninvited, and Crystallis. We then have a rerun strategy guide this issue, as the magazine is revisiting Metroid with a fairly comprehensive guide. However, as I covered Metroid all the way back in Part 3, I'm going to give this game a miss and put a link to Episode 3 in the show notes. We're wrapping up our NES coverage with Shatterhand from Jalico. The article has a rundown of the formulas for the various weapons in the game, with the letter power-ups you pick up, and maps of each level of the game through Area E. Shatterhand is structured a little like Mega Man X, in the sense that you have an opening level which introduces you to most of the game mechanics, and then you have five levels after that that you can do in any order before the final boss level becomes available. Unlike Mega Man X, though, the gameplay is closer to Ninja Gaiden. You go through the levels in the faction of a platformer and engage enemies in melee combat, getting any combination of three alpha or beta characters will get you a sub-weapon, which will stay with you until the launcher for that sub-weapon takes enough damage that it's destroyed, or at the end of the level, whichever comes first. The controls are excellent, and while I'd like a little further range with each melee attack, it does enough damage, and the weapons, are, as far as the special weapons, are, are very useful in most situations. Some are more useful for certain levels than others, naturally. The enemies are also designed well enough that I was able to make the weapons, both sub-weapons and the main melee attack, work for me fairly well. Bosses are also fairly nicely designed. Um, this game definitely is a sort of hidden gem and definitely worth picking up if you can find a copy. Moving on to Game Boy titles, we have Castlevania II, Belmont's Revenge. I've apparently never covered the first Game Boy Castlevania game, so I'll have to remember to cover it in my next Best of the Rest roundup. The guide itself gives a rundown of the weapons and power-ups ga in the game, along with maps of the four main castles and the first half of Dracula's castle. Castlevania II Belmont's Revenge is actually a fairly decent adaptation of the NES series for the Game Boy. The controls are comparable to the NES version, though the game issues stairs in favor of vertical ropes, probably due to situations with number how many screens high you can be and um, screen scrolling and that sort of thing. Um, though the game does incorporate the ropes fairly well into the game's level design. They recognized their limitations, came up with a fix, and really used that fix and owned it. That said, the game was not without its flaws. The NES version did do a good job of prioritizing whip power-ups in candles, so if you died, the first few candles, few candles you got were generally going to be whip power-ups to get you back up to speed, no matter what was in those candles before. Here, this isn't really the case. Um, this is a shame, because otherwise, it's a pretty decent game. I even like the fact that you can pick which of the four castles you take in what order. Again, to bring up the Mega Man comparisons from Shatterhand, a lot like Mega Man. I mean, this is a pretty decent game, and I actually call it an underrated gem for the Game Boy. It's, it's not flawless, it's not a must-own by any means, but it's certainly worth giving a shot, particularly if you're a fan of the Castlevania franchise. Next is another Simpsons game for the Game Boy this time, with Bart Simpson, Escape from Camp Deadly. Bart and Lisa are trying to do a Great Escape-style escape from a summer camp, uh, run presumably by a relative of Mr. Burns. The article gives a map of the game's first level and notes on how to do some of the following levels. Well, 
To damn this game with faint praise, this is probably the best Simpsons game I've played for the show thus far. Not the best Simpsons games I've played, because I've played the Xbox 360 version of the Simpsons Arcade, but the best I've played for this show. Still, it's not a great game. The levels have some significant problems with their structure and how the enemies respond to your weapons. That said, the game manages to balance the platforming on the screen with the size of the sprites fairly well. There are still a few leaps of faith that you have to make. That said, is this game worth picking up? No, not really. Maybe if you want to own every Simpsons game, but it, and it's certainly not as bad as the games that came before, as far as Simpsons games, but I can't give this a recommendation. Next up is Track Meet. A track and field game for the Game Boy with some tongue-in-cheek characters, one of whom is kind of racist. This is a collection of mini-games focused entirely around button mashing the A and B buttons. And this would honestly actually work better with a controller. I mean, man, at least Konami's track and field actually used the D-pad. This one doesn't even do that. Wrapping up our Game Boy games, we have a Game Boy port of Monopoly. This is a very direct port of the NES version of Monopoly, with some minor differences that, because this game was designed for a monochrome system, basically you have some you have a lack of color. You don't have the colors of the properties on the properties on the board. Uh, it doesn't really also render on display on screen where houses are if people build houses. So if you're trying to figure out in advance what role you need or want to hope for to avoid landing on a house, you don't really have that. You just have to kind of remember where all the houses are. That sort of thing. In the Game Boy Classified Information column, we have a drawing mini game in our type for the Game Boy. Nothing fancy. It's just basically drawing dots on screen to make lines. That sort of thing. We then have a NES Q&A article with some basic questions about the NES, covering stuff like the price point, launch date, and whether NES games will still be manufactured. In short, we're going to have a few more years of NES games, so we'll still be covering that system for a while yet. In the SNES preview column, we have looks at Super Ghouls and Ghosts, Howl's Hole-in-One Golf, and R-Type. In, now, in the Now Playing column, we have coverage of the NES port of Sid Meier's Pirates, um, along with two Super Nintendo titles in the also rans Super Bases Loaded and Pilot Wings. Maybe those will get covered in a future issue. Pro they probably will. In the top 30, Ultima 3 has re-entered the list, alongside The Uninvited. Again, just in time for October. We also have newcomers in with Base Wars and Kings of the Beach. In our celeb profile... Profile, we have a actual real live human, as opposed to a cartoon character with Joe Regal Buto, um, who was, at this time is appearing on Murphy Brown. Since Murphy Brown has rapped, he has done a fair amount of directing work on television, along with some TV acting as well. And to wrap up the issue, in Pack Watch, we have a NES port of Ultima 5 Warriors of Destiny, which I think might actually be better served on the SNES, but that's just me. Additionally, the G.I. Joe license has shifted to Capcom, and they're putting out a new G.I. Joe game, which appears to take some structural cues from Bionic Commando. We also have announcements of upcoming releases of UN Squadron and Populous for the Super Nintendo. As with last issue, let's get the easy choice out of the way. F-Zero is a definite must-play for the Super Nintendo. Other than that, I'd recommend picking up Shatterhand for the NES. It's definitely a hidden highlight of the NES's library, and certainly worth your time and attention. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show and would like to toss me a few bucks, you should perhaps consider backing my Patreon. For a buck or two a month, you can help me improve the show. For five a month, you can get your name in the credits. And for even more, you can request episodes for my other series, Breaking It All Down Reviews. Alternatively, alternatively, if you'd rather not do the whole recurring financial thing, I have a tip jar as well, which you should be able to see on my YouTube page. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Yeah.